Join me in the opening, or let us pray. God of the covenant, in our baptism you called us to proclaim the coming of your kingdom. Give us courage like you gave the apostles, that we may faithfully witness to your love and peace in every circumstance of, of life. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, who lived and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But when we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins. Trusting in God's grace, let us together confess our sin. Holy and merciful God, in your presence we confess our failure to be what you create us to be. You alone know how often we have sinned in wandering from your ways, in wasting your gifts, in forgetting your love, by your loving mercy, help us to live your life and abide in your ways for the sake of Jesus Christ our Savior. Hear the good news for anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. Know that you are forgiven and be at peace. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. As we do each week, we take a little time to speak directly to our children, and our children are at home watching, uh, and, and we take that time to speak to each of you, to take a little time out from our worship to, to, to pay attention. Now, as we, um, as we read our story today from uh, the Old Testament from Genesis, we're continuing through Genesis, we hear about Abram, or Abraham. Now, one of the things when you read through this that, that really stands out to me, and this will be in the second half of the reading, is that Sarah, who is Abraham's wife, actually laughs at God. She laughs out loud. And God says, why did you laugh? 
And Sarah says, I didn't laugh. And then God says, but you did. I think it's important sometimes, and I think, I think you as children know this better than any of us, it's important sometimes that, that we just go ahead and laugh at things that are funny. And I think as, as children, you get to lead us in this. You get to remind us in many cases of what's funny. So I encourage you, you know, this space here in church, we, we take it very seriously. We take listening to these stories seriously. But if we're not also laughing every so once in a while, then we're taking things too seriously. So I encourage each of you, when we're here together in worship, don't be afraid to laugh if you think it's something funny. In church, we should be having, we shouldn't be so serious that we never laugh. And I think sometimes you as children get to remind the rest of us of that. So don't be afraid to, to be a little silly in church. Don't be afraid to laugh every once in a while, particularly when you're in Sunday school. It is intended to be fun and enjoyable, and I encourage that. And pretty much wherever you are, humor, jokes, it's all really important. We're not human if we're not also laughing. So I really want us to remember that today, to take that away from our readings, from our time together. Remember how important it is to laugh and to tell jokes. And don't be afraid when you're around adults, if you have some jokes ready, be like, hey, you guys want to hear a joke? And go ahead and tell it. And know wherever you are, whatever you're doing, you have this whole community of faith that is here for you, that loves you and supports you. And we're looking forward to having you back amongst us soon. So thank you. And thank you for being with us. Our first reading is Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 5. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and, and the, the ones who curse you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Abram took his wife Sarai and his brother's son Lot and all the possessions they had gathered and the persons whom they had acquired in Haran. And they set forth to go to the land of Canaan when they had become to the land of, oh, that's it. Thank you. Looks like we got a little bit of a dangling participle at the end of that last verse. So again, uh, before we start the second reading, um, the story of Abraham is, is pretty lengthy. Uh, and, and I was kind of going back and forth about how much of Abraham we wanted to get into. And as I was rereading it, um, and I recommend folks, if you haven't read Genesis chapters 12 through 22 in a while, go ahead and read it. It doesn't take that long. Um, there's some pretty weird stuff in there. Uh, and I think it's important for us to remember sometimes how interesting is maybe a, a kind way of putting it, the, uh, the Old Testament can be, and how, um, how, how we get this sense, I think, when we're children and we're in Sunday school that, that everything is neat and clean, and then you go and you read through the story of Abraham and you realize that things aren't always neat and clean and go the way that we want them to. So um, that's a, a separate sermon for a separate day. I wanted to focus in on, on the call of Abraham today. We're gonna talk about Abraham again next week and then we'll move on to um, Isaac the week after and Jacob the week up after that, um, which will be my last Sunday. Um, but again, there's so much to Abraham, and this is just a little snippet uh, of the whole Abraham story. But I want to get this sense of, of you know, Abraham and Sarai are, are 75 years old um, when, when they get this call. You know, this is still, I mean, yes, Abraham lives to be like a, like 180 years old or something like that. But 75 is still old. It would have been heard as old. It would have been understood that this was a second half of life. And in this beginning, you, you almost get this sense of excitement out of Abraham 
and Sarah and, and this new journey that they have in front of them. Um, and what we're missing here is, is from 12 to 18, um, a lot of time passes. And, and in this chapter 18, I think Sarah and Abraham are both in their 90s at this point. And this has been from 75 to 90, we're talking 15 years have passed and nothing has really happened. And God keeps on saying, no, Abraham, I promise I will make your descendants like the, the stars in the night sky. And Abraham's kind of going, come on, God, I'm getting old here. And I think it's important that we appreciate everything. I had to really snip it this down to get it so that it made sense coming from the pulpit. But that this is a story that goes on for a while and a lot of things happen between that call that we get in the first reading and then this kind of actual fulfillment of call that we get in the second reading. Um, and this is about a year before Isaac is born. We also have a lot that happens with Hagar and Ishmael, and there's just there's a whole lot that goes on between these two readings. So I encourage you if you get a chance to read between these, but for now we're going to focus on this idea of call and this notion that, that, that this, this took 15 years from the first call, which was already late in life to be considering having kids, to where they're 90. Um, and that's where we're kind of meeting Abraham and Sarah at this point. They're, they're in their 90s. They still haven't gotten this call that started at 75, and this is where we begin. So with this in our, in our hearts and our minds, let us listen for the word of the Lord. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamar as he sat at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. He looked up and saw three men standing near him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent entrance to meet them and bowed down to the ground. He said, My Lord, if I find favor with you, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. Let me bring a little bread that you may refresh yourselves, and after that you may pass on, since you have come to your servant. So they said, Do as you have said. And Abraham hastened into the tent to Sarah and said, Make ready quickly three measures of choice flour, knead it, and make cakes. Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to the servant, who hastened to prepare it. And he took curds and milk from the calf that he had prepared and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree while they ate. They said to him, where is your wife Sarah? And he said, There, in the tent. Then Wud said, I will surely return to you in due season, and your wife Sarah shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent entrance behind him. Now, Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in age. It had ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. So Sarah laughed it to herself, saying, After I have grown old and my husband is old, shall I have pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too wonderful for the Lord? At the set time I will return to you in due season, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied, saying, I did not laugh. Or Sarah denied, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. And he said, oh yes, you did laugh. The word of the Lord. Let us pray. Gracious God, we turn to you for guidance, for hope, for understanding, for illumination on the path that lies ahead of us. Help us hear these words and allow it to deepen our faith, allow it to deepen our understanding of you and what it means to be your people in this world.
May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you. Amen. So I figured um, I wanted to really focus in on this idea of, of laughing and what it means to faith. So I wanted to start with a joke. You guys ready? <laughs> this is so bad. Um, how do you make holy water? You boil the hell out of it. <laughs> I know, bad dad jokes. You know, I was, I was thinking about humor today and kind of how humor works its way into the church and how we approach humor. And I was kind of thinking, it's not exactly the same, but I was thinking of this time, you know, for those of you who are parents, maybe you have experience with this, where your kid does something that they're really not supposed to do and you are just really upset at them. And I think this is particularly true when they're like, what, three, four, or five? And, and you say, you're not, oh, I'm so angry at you. And then they just say something or do something that's just so ridiculously funny that you're in the middle of trying to yell, but you can't do anything but just laugh, right? And, uh, you know, and when I was teaching, you'd hear these stories of teachers who were trying to be real serious in the classroom. And there's this, this kind of school of thought when it comes to teaching that you shouldn't smile for like the first like three months. The kids know you're tough. And, uh, and I remember this one teacher trying to explain this to us, and, uh, and he's trying to act all tough, and, and some kid does something that's clearly not what they're supposed to do, but it's hilarious, and he has to just like run out of the room and crack up laughing because he can't handle it. I wonder how bad would it have been if he had just started laughing right there in the middle of the room, but regardless. And then I think of... Um, <laughs> I think of when I was a kid in church, and maybe some of us have this same experience. Uh, my friend Jeff and I, remember I think it was one year during Christmas Eve, our pastor was pretty serious, uh, Pastor Dottie. Um, she was a pretty serious person. And, uh, and we're sitting there, and, and you know how when you do the candles, she was very clear, it's like, listen, you need to make sure that the lit candle stays this way and that you take the other candle so that you don't drip wax all over the place because wax is really hard to get out. And she would take all this extra time to do it and, um, and me and my friend Jeff in the back, are, we're joking around, <laughs> and we're doing the candles not the right way we're supposed to, and we're doing it intentionally. And you can just see her just give us the eye, right? There's this sense in church that church is supposed to be really serious. But as, as any of us know, laughter really cuts tension. It, it releases something. Um, the best example that I can come up with, and as a pastor I've seen this plenty of times, is at a funeral. And if somebody's telling a story about somebody and it's, and it's funny, and people laugh, there's just this, this resting that happens. And the mood changes. And as a pastor, you can literally see people processing it better. There's this kind of tightness that we get where we don't allow our feelings to come through. And you, as a pastor, you can literally see it. You know, or at a wedding, uh, when I try to do a wedding and I try to do a sermon at a wedding, my goal is always to make people laugh and to make people cry because you get at something when you do that. And laughing, we get that. It releases something. It releases some of that tension. It makes us, makes us more receptive and if nothing else, I think the best way to describe it is, is we become more receptive to the spirit able to move within us. And this isn't just at funerals, you know. <laughs> this pandemic has been going on so long, and I don't know if anybody remembers a few months ago or if you were aware of this, there was a video that came out where there was a lawyer, and he was in a Zoom video, and there was like this cat thing that was on his face, and it looked like he was talking, you know exactly what I'm talking about. I got to say, this is, and he goes, ah, oh, oh, I don't know what happened. I swear I'm not a cat. And it's just like one of the funniest things I've ever seen. And after months of being in pandemic, I just remember laughing and laughing and laughing and laughing. And it just was healing and it felt good. This laughter, this laughter is important. And the Old Testament and the Bible really as a whole is, is full of this kind of humor. And 
you know, the, the, I think the best way to, to, to think of it is in Jonah. Um, it doesn't quite come across in the English, but in the Hebrew, there's this very, the way the Hebrew comes across, it's kind of like timing in a language. It doesn't always translate. But in the Hebrew, in Jonah, there's this kind of like, Jonah was told by God to do this thing. Jonah turned and ran the other way, which we don't get the same thing in the English, but in the Hebrew, it's really, it's funny. And you, you kind of laugh out loud. Or, or the fact that there's just stories like this where, where Abraham and Sarah are in their old age. And I really think that this, after I've grown old, my husband is old, shall I have pleasure? I think that's really intended to kind of be a joke, to be kind of silly, to be funny. Moses having a speech impediment. Here he is, he's supposed to be the, the, the voice piece of God, and he can't speak clearly. We forget that because we're used to the Charleston Heston Moses, but in the Bible, Moses is like this little guy that, that stutters. And as somebody who stuttered as a kid, I gotta say, it's a great example. We have these kind of, these jokes built in. So much so, that I had a professor in seminary, a New Testament professor, who was convinced, convinced that, that Jesus was understood as this pithy guy who would tell jokes. And the example that he uses is um, mustard, uh, faith like a mustard seed, right? Which is really small. But if you've ever seen a mustard plant, it's really not that big. And my professor was convinced that Jesus was trying to tell a joke. He said, oh, if you have faith like a mustard seed, then it'll grow into a mustard tree where all the birds of the field will live because a mustard plant only gets maybe this high. They were not talking an oak tree. They had cedars. They had big trees. And he's convinced that there's this, there's this kind of pithiness, this, this intentional humor that Jesus puts into his parables and his teachings. And we miss some of that, I think, sometimes. This, this humor, this, the, the fact that there's jokesters and tricksters, it's an essential part of the human experience. And sometimes I feel like the ancients, they understood this better. I think if you look at, at both African folklore and Native American folklore, you have really clear stories that include tricksters, that include jokesters that go around and intentionally kind of mess with stuff. And for some reason, and, and I remember talking to the, somebody about this recently, I think a pastor, about how, when did we lose that? When did we lose some of that sense of humor that was always built into faith? I mean, again, <laughs> it's right here. Here, Abraham's call is serious stuff. This is the father of, of like, everything in, in Christianity and Judaism and Islam and, and a couple other religions. I found out that there's um, the Druze also include Abraham as, as, a, as kind of the founder of the religion. The Samaritans probably did too. This moment of call, this is serious stuff. And yet the folks that, that are retelling us this account include the fact that this is so absurd that Sarah laughs at out loud. I have to imagine that this is intended to be a little silly, a little funny. That that humor is intentional. It's not accidental. It's even true in old monastic traditions of this kind of idea of the wise fool, of, of a monk that would go around and just play pranks. And that's like all they did. You know, we keep on talking about how with the pandemic, and I know we're kind of sick of talking about the pandemic, but the reality is, is, is we do, we're at this moment where things are going to be resetting. We have some choices. We can decide what comes next as we rebuild, as we refill this space. We get some choices of what happens. And I hope that when we read passages like this for and I don't want to negate the seriousness of this and the fact that, you know, on the cover we have one of the greatest icons ever painted and it represents the three visitors at Mamar. 
And this is a huge central story in the Christian tradition in Judaism and Islam. This is a huge story. But let's not also forget that there is some humor right in the middle of it. That whatever we decide to make, whatever, whatever the church, and I'm not just talking about Rockville, I'm talking about I really do think that the mainline church is going to be going through a, quite a bit of a reset in the next couple years. It's not going to happen right away. But how do we make sure that we include some of this humor? That we don't take ourselves so seriously that, that, that we can't laugh once in a while. And I kind of remember sitting in the back of church and goofing around. And, you know, if you goof around in church, people turn around and stare at you. And they're like, no, you're not supposed to do that. Now, admittedly, if you can't hear people, that's probably a, a little bit rude. But how do we work in some of this, this, this humor? How do we make sure that we, we, we embrace the fullness of the human experience? Yeah, we need to take these stories seriously. We need to be in the midst of a funeral. We need to understand what the purpose is and that mourning is important. But we also know that, that a laugh or two can help with the process. It can help us heal. So I guess, you know, as I'm leaving, I, I have these four more sermons that I'm going to offer you guys. And I, and I really believe that over this last year, I really believe this, that part of the reason that I've been with you is to help you get through the pandemic and help just try to offer some, some perspective and to help pivot coming out of this in the way that, that, that God is hoping that you will pivot. That I've been kind of this transitional person here. And so what I'm hoping to do over these last couple sermons is just really pull out from Scripture what it means to be full of faith. Because I'm telling you, folks that are out there, the young folks that, that don't go to church, they're, they're striving. They're, they're, they want spirituality in their lives, but they want a full spirituality. The more we can create and cultivate as communities of faith this fullness of spirit, which includes humor, the better we're going to be able to serve and be in the world and share that fullness of Christ's love. So it's a balance. I think, I don't know. I feel like we miss this a lot in our current culture. We, we miss the balance. It's one or the other. It's black or white. Everything is... Either we're offended or, or we're absolutely 100% behind it, and we're not finding a lot of gray area these days. You're either on the right side of the aisle or the wrong side of the aisle. You're either with us or against us. I really believe the church has to find these balances where we can be serious but silly, where we can listen and be compassionate but still disagree. It's the balance. It's this balance of appreciating that, that one of the wisest things that I think anybody can learn is that sometimes life is just absurd. That a 90-year-old woman is called to create a nation. And that we also learn that in the midst of that absurdity, God is still in the middle of it. Whether we're laughing, whether we're crying, whether we're engaged in debate, whether we're hugging, God is in the middle of it all, offering love and almost certainly laughing with us. What good news we do receive. Amen. Now I ask if you're able to stand as we reflect on the word, we unite our voices together with the, the words, the ancient words of the Apostles' Creed, which unite us with all who have come before, all who say these words today, and all who are still yet to say these words. So that let us join our voices together and confess our faith, saying, 
I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and Jesus Christ, his Son, our Lord, Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. So at this time, we, we, you can sit, you can, you can be seated. At this time, we, uh, we respond to the word. One of the ways that we respond is, is we make a commitment. We make a commitment to God, we make a commitment to the community, we make a commitment to each other. One of the ways that we can do that is, is, is by putting money in the offering plate or, or giving online or, or, or in the mail, however we give. As I'm gonna probably sound like a broken record for this for the next few weeks, one of the things, the, about the only thing I'm sure about changing in this post-pandemic world is we're gonna get a lot less money in the plate and a lot more money online. So that means that this particular ritual is gonna change a little bit. Um, so as, as the plates come around, it's not just about our financial commitment, and that doesn't mean I wanna lessen how important our financial commitment is because we create the opportunity to be the space for the community, and that's why we do this. Um, but it's also an opportunity if you, if you wanna write down a commitment or write down a prayer so you have something to put in the offering plate if maybe you give online or you mail in uh, an offering monthly. Um, take this time, not just as a collection of funds so that we can be Christ's hands and feet in the world, but, but really an intentional time to acknowledge the commitment that we make. And for all of you that are home, you can give online, um, you can send, uh, you can send um, tithes and offerings to the church. So with this in mind is, is how he plays our offertory. Let us reflect on that that we offer, not just our tithes, but ourselves, um, our love to the church, to the community, to our neighbors, to the world, all the things that we do. So with that in our hearts, your tithes, your offerings will now be accepted. pray. Eternal God, we praise you that your glory has dawned on us and brought us into this day of resurrection. We rejoice that the grave could not hold your son and that he has conquered death, risen to rule over all powers of this earth with love and compassion and forgiveness. We praise you that he summons us into new life to follow him with joy and gladness and humor. By your spirit, Lift us from doubt and despair and set our feet in Christ's holy way that our lives may be signs of his life and all we have may show forth his love. Praise, glory, and thanksgiving to you, our God, 
forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. Now at this time, we move towards the table. We move towards this table. This is another one of these instances where I think sometimes we, we get so serious, so caught up in the ritual of the Lord's Supper that, that we forget that this was a simple meal of bread and wine shared among friends. A simple meal shared among friends. And each time we do that, not just here at this table, but every time we share a meal with loved ones, we have the opportunity to remember and confess Christ's love for the world. So as we move towards the table, we will do so singing. You can remain seated, even though it says stand. I think it's fine that we sit for this one. Um, but we'll sing the communion hymns, uh, Loaves Were Broken, Words Were Spoken, hymn number 498, verses 1 and 4. things to remember um, as we do communion um, are during the um, during the the great thanksgiving there's an opportunity um, to say aloud uh, any any names or prayers that you might have on your heart this day um, so we're not going to be doing prayers to the people we just do prayer of, prayer of great thanksgiving so be that just like we've been doing the last few weeks we have that opportunity for silence if there's a name you want to make sure you get out there. Um, if there's any specific prayers you want us to know about, um, go ahead and, and just touch base with me afterwards, whether you just want me to know about it or if you want to have the whole church praying for somebody, we can do that. Um, of course, uh, just real quick remembering uh, Marty Heilman uh, and keeping him in our prayers is, is kind of top of our list uh, this week amongst others, and I'm sure there are others, but uh, keep, keep that in our mind. Um, also, uh, hopefully everybody remembers last time, um, kind of because of COVID and we don't want people passing the plate, um, what we're going to do is folks will come down this side. Um, Bernice is going to come up and serve, not just yet, sorry, Bernice. Um, I'm just letting people know. <laughs> uh, Bernice will come up when, when the time is ready uh, <laughs> um, to, to stand, and she'll be serving the bread. I'll be serving uh, the, the, the fruit of the vine. Um, and uh, if you're unable to stand, um, uh, Patty and Rachel uh, are going to be kind of coming down the row, and they're going to have a plate that's going to have kind of both bread and uh, uh, grape juice on it. So if you can't stand, you can get it from them. There's very few of us here today, so I th don't think this is going to be particularly challenging. Um, but just a reminder as you come down, uh, please do hit the, uh, the, the um, hand sanitation station and then come on over and then grab the, the juice and the bread. I'm going to ask everybody if you can bring that back to your seat. We're not going to eat it right away. We'll eat it together uh, as one people. And if you're at home, 
Um, this is the time, uh, I'm hoping I'm looking at the right camera. This is the time, go get uh, some bread or some grape juice and some water or, you know, heck, if you have wine, go ahead and grab that, that's okay. Um, but this is about all of us doing this together, whether we're here, whether we're someplace else in time and space. Um, it's about this act of community and being one people and being reminded that this, this, this is the gift of Christ, that we are a community of people and that we get to share this meal together, even if we're not physically present to one another. Um, so hopefully I've, we've explained this enough and we're ready to go. And with that, let us pray. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Praise to you, O God, for all your works. You created the world and called it good and made us in your image to live together in love. You made a covenant with us, and even when we turned from you, you remained ever faithful. Therefore, with all creation, we sing your praise. Holy, 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 Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Thank you, O oh God, for sending us your son. He lived among us and told your story. He healed the sick and welcomed sinners. He shared our pain and died our death, then rose to new life that we might live and all creation be restored. Remembering your boundless love revealed to us in Jesus Christ, we break bread and share this cup, giving ourselves to you to live for him in joy and praise. For great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these your gifts of bread and wine, that they may be for us the body and blood of Christ, and that we may be his body for the world. By your spirit, unite us with Christ and one another until we feast with him and with all your saints. And we take this time now to take a few moments to, to rest in your most perfect language of silence, to lift up the names that may be on our heart or to simply open ourselves up to your love knowing that, that you find the prayers that we have and you find the ways to bring them to the world. So let us take that moment now. For gracious God, in your eternal realm of justice and peace, we are present and thankful. Now, through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor are yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Now on the night of Jesus' arrest, the night before he was crucified, the Lord took bread, and he broke it after giving thanks, saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup saying this is the cup of the new covenant sealed in my blood. Every time you drink it, do this 
in remembrance of me. And in this way, in this simple meal, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Before we begin communion, let us pray in the way that Christ taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us pray. Merciful God, we give thanks that you have invited us to this table. We give thanks that you 
have received us as members of the body of Christ and have affirmed us as a community of faith. Lead us to live as faithful and dedicated disciples in service to all the world. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. This is a part of the opportunities for service and fellowship, and I'm just going to go over a couple things that are in the midsection of the bulletins or the other part of the uh, email that was sent. Uh, first thing is the sensibility, so keep collecting all those coins. We take dollars too, and there is a place in the calm room that they are collecting those when you get we get all done with it. Also, the Rainbow Place is doing a raffle. Uh, please get on their website to get more information, or for those of you who are here, there's also some more information in the hallway um, bulletin board. Thank you. Now, it's interesting. I was um, looking for hymns, uh, and this maybe speaks to the nature of our church. I couldn't find any hymns about humor, <laughs> and, and, or at least ones that were appropriate. There's one that I remember from uh, Boy Scout days, but that's not appropriate to sing in church, probably. Um, but regardless, uh, we are still talking about call. We're talking about Abraham's call. We're talking about how sometimes our call can take a while. Our call can sometimes feel a little absurd, but God's still in the midst. And so we use our hymn, our sending hymn today, and I ask you to rise if you can. Uh, the classic hymn of call, the one that's sung at probably every ordination ceremony I've ever been at. But are sending him, I, the Lord of sea and sky, or here I am, Lord. So let us join our voices together. We go into the world from this place. We go in joy, and we go singing. We truly are called. We are called as our full selves, full of humor, full of joy, full of compassion, full of sorrow, full of pain, all of it. 
we're called as full humans, let us bring all of that into this space as well. And let us bring that also into the world as we go from here. So as we go, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Alleluia. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen. Still and